Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Angie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey. How are you, Las Vegas? Sober. I think I'm part of the whole thing, huh? I used to be that when I was drinking, too. Uh, I am now no longer homeless. Um, I used to live in uh, Orange County, and then I, I 13 step Richard and captured him and moved to Blythe. And then uh, his mother's house kicked me out of there, so my asthma got bad, so we moved to Huntington Beach, and we lived in a I think it was an apartment, but it felt like I was living in a motel. And so now we live, we have a home in Beaumont, California, and it's another bumfuck Egypt, but. <laughs> I really, really am glad that Bob has asked me here to be here on such a special day. There are so many people here, including one of my sponsors that came from Utah to look me right in the eye. And that's, that's fine. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't I care who I abuse. And she just happens to be one, she just happens to be one of my favorite targets. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something, uh, she, there's a place in my heart for all the women that I have sponsored and that I sponsor. Uh, and there's a very special place in my heart uh, for a, for Cheryl because, you see, I remember a year ago where I went uh, and I saw her in a place and she was just another person, um, another woman, and I don't pay much attention to the women anyway. But uh, I looked at those beautiful eyes and I saw the pain and out of my mouth came you are in such incredible pain. And it was a terrible mistake for me to say that because she immediately started crying and all this. I can't cry, you know, I can't. And today, I, I got, last night, I had an opportunity to see her in the same place under the same circumstances and she glowed. She glowed. And that has got to be the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous in action, to have been a part of witnessing a part of that is an incredible feeling that money, property, and prestige cannot buy, you see. And that's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I um, I'm here, came here to tell you what I used to be like, and what happened, and what I'm like now. I was uh, born a long, long time ago uh, in a planet far, far away <laughs> into a family that never got over a stunned look in their face because I would belong to them. Uh, they didn't know what to do with me from the very beginning. I didn't have a name when they brought me home from the hospital. And because my daddy wanted to name me after his girlfriend, and my mother's narrow-minded. So from the begin, from the beginning, I didn't fit into this family. I had an older sh sister that was perfect. And uh, uh, then I had a younger brother. And uh, as a little girl, I never knew how to be good. And they were always whipping on me. I didn't know that that there was that I was a better child. But I held it against them, guys. I blamed them for everything else. I thought I didn't know how to be good, and because and that's why I got whipped. And they were divorced when I was seven, and my mother would say to things to me like, "You're just like your father," with her little purple little purple lips. She's not a, she's a Mexican, so she's got little purple lips. She's just like your father. And I knew what her opinion was of him. So she'd send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then, and it isn't appealing to me now. <laughs> and, you know, as soon as they said, thou shalt not, 
I may not have thought of doing it before, but as soon as it says, thou shalt not, I had an overwhelming desire to do it. And it would get in my head, and I couldn't think of anything else. So somebody dared me, and I raised the nun's kerchief, what she wore under all them clothes, and they 86 me from catechism. And I got home, got my whipping. That was... And the next day when I got to school, all the kids thought I was terrific. I could not believe all the attention that I was getting. Because you see, me, I was born with an emptiness in my soul. There was always a longing, a hunger, a yearning to be loved, to be accepted, and to be wanted. I was always so hungry to be loved that I'd have given my heart to anybody that would take it to anything you want to me. Just don't leave me, and please love me. That was the way I always was. That was normal for me. So when I got that attention, it filled up some of them empty places. I like to think that I always had the pilot lit. Well, all I ever needed was the fuel. My mother took up with a man that was starting to get a little funny with me. And I said, look here what this man is trying to do. And she said, you're a liar. You've always been a liar. And I had been, but I wasn't lying there. She said, you can't stand for anybody to be happy, and you're never going to fit in anywhere because you are that make people around you miserable. I know that my mother must have said some kind words, and people must have had said some kind words along the way, but I never heard those. All I ever heard was the thing that, that there was something ugly and repulsive about me that people could not stand. And I started, this is the time, I started running away from me a long time before I ever took the drink. I would go and read books, and I would hide myself in books, and especially fairy tales for the princess and prince that comes and kisses the princess, and they live happily ever after. And all I really wanted was somebody to love me and live happily ever after. Now, I, when I started to think about it, I'm going to be like with my daddy, because I know my daddy, he'll love me. So my daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley, and I stole money. I always stole money, because I didn't have any of my own. So I used to steal it. I'm really a thief, and when they say those things about Mexican thieves, I don't know about the rest of them, but I am a thief. And uh, I like being a thief. Uh, it always was much more, it tastes better when it's stolen, doesn't it? it just, when it's not quite legal, it tastes better, feels better. So I stole money and went off to my daddy. My daddy had taken up light housekeeping with a lady with eight kids, and all he wants is one more. And he used to take people up north to pick grapes and prunes, and we were fruit pickers. And you know, God made two kinds of Mexicans. says so fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And I'm not a fruit picker. They try to make a fruit picker out of me. You know, Richard and I are both dedicated to making me happy. Yeah. And, and he knows I don't like to work. So, you know, and so what he, we've decided is that if he ever feels like he's going to croak, he's going to run to the freeway and need a truck so he can get double indemnity on his, and I can get double indemnity on his insurance because I don't want to work. You know. I think it's going to work. I 13-stepped him. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> yes, well, I was over up north uh, with the Gallo brothers picking grapes in uh, some place out of the twilight zone called Livingstone. And we stayed beyond the season, and they gave my dad a case of sherry wine, and somebody must have said, thou shalt not. I had a big water glass of that sherry. I looked about that big, and it went, went in there. It went boom. I mean, I felt like I put my fingers in the light socket. Everything felt wonderful. There wasn't any, I felt like everybody else. I was rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, and I loved it. And I knew that if, that, if I could always feel, that's what I knew life should feel like. And so I'm, I'm not a sipper, I'm a chug-a-lugger. If that's going to be that good, I know the next one's going to be better. And then it's the next day. 
I don't know how it happened. And I come to, I was, I told you I was born a long time ago. And then by this time, when the Pachuco days, you know, the, the, got the big hairdo. You come back to the next day, your hair is all stuck to your face. <laughs> oh my God, awful feeling. You feel so dry. You ain't had water for a month. You put your mouth under the spigot. You get drunk all over again with all that water. Out. It was so wonderful. I couldn't wait to do it again. I'm just a child. I don't can get it. I came back to my mother shortly after because they didn't want me there either. And she didn't want me. She said she did, they'd been free of me over a year and did not want me back. And I had a knot the size of my fist on my throat. I wanted to cry so bad. But I said, I don't care. I don't care. I don't give a damn. You see, I had to put that exterior so you wouldn't see the shame and the fear that I had inside of me. And I started living here and there wherever anybody would put up with me for a little while. In those days, we didn't live in the street. We lived with people, and people would have put up with me for a little while. And this is a time when uh, we joined the gangs. You know, we Mexicans, we like to join the gangs and beat each other up and call it fun. We have knifings and shootings, and we, people say, look, at they're killing each other. We don't know we're going to kill each other. We're just having fun. Yes, I was one of the original topless, bottomless dancers in Orange County in them parties, and I don't even remember it. I don't even get paid for it. But the girls always wanted to tell me what to do, so I used to beat them up, and they didn't tell me, because I was bad. I beat up anybody that, would, that wanted beating up. And I thought that was fun, you see. I also don't know how to work. So I take a burglary. It seemed to be a good idea at the time. I was really surprised when the state of California discovered me, and, and they took me before a judge, and there sat my mother and all the mother purple lip people looking at me. You know, they look at you with that, I told you so look in their eyes. And the judge looked at me and said, well, young lady, what do you think we ought to do with you? And I put my collar up, you know, I slick, hip, and cool people, put a collar up and slouch down, huh? And say, you're the judge, man, you ought to know. You know, there was a wrong person to have that kind of an attitude with. He sent me and my attitude to do a little bit of time for the state of California. You know, I didn't like it there. I don't like people telling me I can't go somewhere. So when they finally let me out, I took my first inventory. I don't have a job, I don't have a home, I don't have any money, I don't have any education, and I'm thinking, what in order? I can't go through with it. I better go find me a husband, because God knows I need somebody to take care of me. And I went out looking for a husband in places that husbands are not to be looked for. <laughs> and unfortunately for both of us, I found one. You know, there's a certain kind of man always caught my attention. They always had them really tight T-shirts, tattoos. I know everybody's got ink today, but in those days, only the bad boys had ink. And he just, he had born to lose, mother. <laughs> they walk with a little slouch, the hair all greasy, all teeth, shiny eyes. And they say, they almost dance when they walk, don't they? Say, What's happening, baby? Oh, God, it just makes, still brings me chills all the way through. <laughs> I used to think that look was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> ah. My sponsor, Mary Reagan, used to say, Angie, you just can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. But we tried, I tell you, we tried. He built them castles in the air, and I lived in them. And three months later, we were pregnant, and I was married. And he had an idea of what a good Mexican wife should be, and I had an idea of what a good Mexican husband should be, and never the twain shall meet. And we both got the scars to prove it. <laughs> he decides I should stay home. I don't stay home silently. <laughs> when he happens to be home after a nice long weekend, I'm waiting for him. As he walks in the door, I tell him about who copulated with his mother when he was conceived. 
and who copulated with his grandmother, how many copulated with both people. And he don't want me to talk that way about his mother. And he says, if you don't, if you don't shut up, bitch, I'm going to hit you. Well, that sure smacks a thou shalt to me. I jumped him every time. And he thought he was such a bad dude, I went straight for his face. See how he explained all them scratches to his partners. He thought he was such a bad pachuco dude. I love that. I love it. <laughs> we were really equipped for you for our parenthood. <laughs> By the time I had my baby, I knew that he didn't love me. I knew that nobody had ever loved me. When they put that baby in my arms, I felt like finally somebody belongs to me. She was my baby. I love my baby. I worship my baby. I, she was my baby. That baby inspired feelings within me that nobody ever had before, and very few people sin since. And I promised her I would never beat her, abandon her, and discard her as I had been. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. If I could have done it any different, I would have done it for my baby. But I'm an alcoholic. And I am a woman alcoholic. And when I drink, I have absolutely no choices and no rights. When I do, when I drink, I'm going to do what's in front of me to do because it's there to do. I never think about prices. I never think about tomorrow. I just know I got to go. I got to go because I got to go because I can't stand to live inside of me. By this time, that man had introduced me to little white pills with crosses on them. And I used to have one eyeball over there and one over there, and I'd make baby clothes all night long. <laughs> Chew the inside of your mouth, scratch. Try to put an eyebrow on when you're going to go party. You know? <laughs> My, that, that, uh, that daughter now, that she's an old lady now. She used to say, Mom, you were a tweaker. I said, I was not a, I was not a tweaker. I was having fun all by myself. Put in my eyebrow on. <laughs> Somebody identifies over here. <laughs> and I took that baby and her sister to places the children should not be taken. I left their daddy because I knew I was old. I was 22 years old and I felt old, older than I do today at 72. I felt very, very old and used up. And he said to me, babes, when I leave you, the dogs ain't going to look at you. And I believed him. And I went out and I spent five years as an unprotected by a drinking woman. I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that a woman alcoholic goes through when she's unprotected and she, she's a blackout drinker and she drinks in bars. The feel of not be, of being, always being dirty, to looking at the clean people and knowing I can never feel like they looked. I spent five years of this type of madness. Many times I would come home where there was not enough chemicals to kill what I had in that cold water shack, that when I would come in, the sink would be black with cockroaches, and there was mice on that filthy floor. And in that shack lived two little girls that the romance of being a mother had long since died, and the responsibility for them choked me. They would have their little quarrels and whispers, and uh, because they were afraid when I would come to before my time, I would start screaming and yelling, and then I would start hitting, and I would hit, and I hit, and I was like seeing somebody else, and I'd say, for God's sakes, well, just stop, and I wouldn't stop, and I couldn't stop until I was spent, and there was blood and tears. And one time, there was a little girl leaning in front of me, and she said, Mommy, please don't beat me anymore. And many years later, I heard that little voice say, Mommy, Mommy, please come and get me from jail. I can't stand it. And the first time, well, I couldn't because of my disease. And the second time, I couldn't because of her disease. I heard somebody once say that whoever wrote the book, although I don't believe that any of the books should be changed, but whoever wrote in the book, we will not regret the past, 
and I wish to shut the door in it, could never, never have had the heart of a mother that beat her children, that abandoned her children, like I did, you see, because those pictures are always before me. I do not regret my experiences. I regret the journey that my children went through because of my, me and my disease. You see, that I do. And, and I have to tell you now that, that my children and I are friends today because they are both members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's down the road. But I want to tell those mothers that have that tremendous guilt, and fathers too, that their God makes it all okay. God all levels it out <laughs> with time. With time and sobriety, it all gets leveled up. But I was not sober. I had some more drinking to do. That guy got out of the penitentiary, my first husband. I'm a multi-marrier. Uh, I've been um, married five times to three husbands, so, you know, some some of us just got to do it over again. And uh, he sent pictures home and says, babes, this time is going to be different. And we made the Mexican Geographic. We moved to uh, about half hour from Mama to a place called Miraloma. Blythe had been called the armpit of California. My experience with Miraloma was another part of the anatomy not worth mentioning. <laughs> but because you see, it was there that every hope and every dream went out of my life, where my drinking changed. Before, I had been a party girl and a bar drinker, and um, all the bullshit we goes with that life. Now I became a bedroom drinker. I became a bedroom drinker because it was no longer fun. Being with people, people were just so repulsed by me. I was so abusive. I got to the place in my drinking that all I wanted to do was to drink and to drink and to drink. And it came, I would drink and drink, and it got to the place. I would lay in a fetal position and cry out in agony because I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and all I wanted to do was to die. I could no longer kill that madness. No matter what kind of poison I put inside of me, I could no longer kill that madness inside of me. And I started looking and wanting answers. I started going to churches where they dip you, they dunk you, they throw flowers at you, they pray over you all, and nothing ever took because, you see, I was too damaged, damaged to be on repair. And I tried to kill myself one day while this man was was home because I, I didn't want to kill myself and my children filed to find me. So I waited until he was home and I saved enough pills to kill a horse. And, and uh, I told him I was going to kill myself and he said, okay. And uh, uh, we had a slight communication problem. <laughs> and I went, I went and took a bath. You know, you gotta take a bath and make sure the house don't look too bad just in case them people come over. They won't know how you lived. So I went and took a bath and went to bed to die. And I don't know how you ever, you that are suicidal, how you were. But I was relieved Dad, that it was gonna be all over, that I didn't have to do it anymore. So when I came to a couple of days later, I was not glad to be alive. I was enraged to be alive because I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I couldn't die and there's no place else to go. There's nothing. This man had been in bed with me both nights while I was in that coma and never once did he consider taking me to a doctor or to a hospital. I came to with my pajama bottoms off and you can imagine how I felt like a piece of used meat that nobody wants. I look upon that day that's got to be the loneliest, most despair day of my life, and I realize that my higher power has always had his hand on my life, even upon that day. There's a knock on the door. There's a lady from the PTA. If there's somebody I didn't want to see, it's a lady from the PTA. And there stood Mrs. Clean and said, Hi. She took one look at me and she said, what is wrong? I must have been downwind from her because, you know, I'd been in the same clothes for a couple of days and nights and I hadn't made it to the bathroom. I had uh, some accidents along the way, but if you're a wine drinker, you have accidents. And um, in a moment of weakness, I let her in and I told her about my tale of woe. And uh, I think I spoke too long because she got a bright look in her eye, and she asked me if I ever heard of Al-Anon. 
I'd never heard of Al Anon, but I got the idea that if I went there, he would straighten up. I knew if he would straighten up, I'd be okay. And uh, so I, she cleaned me up and took me to Al Anon, and somehow I didn't fit in in Al Anon now. <laughs> I uh, f- felt a little bit like a whore went in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square broads. But you know, they hugged, them clean ladies hugged me, and so I smiled at them. Yeah. Some place along the line, somebody had said I had a beautiful smile. So I gave him the smile. Probably somebody wanted more than the smile. But at your own risk. And so I gave him, I gave him that smile that the lights are on but nobody home smile. I found out later that they laughed at me. I thought I was fooling them. But I stayed throughout the meeting and them clean ladies hugged me. And I, it made me feel good to be with them. And then I went back into the garbage can. I went back into the hole. And uh, well, that day, every so often she'd come get me and take me there. And uh, I didn't hear anything, but I heard the word release. And I told him in detail how I was going to release him. So he used to sleep with his clothes on and a knife under the pillow. And I sit in a corner with a black coat on and watch him. As he'd be a doze enough, I'd go take a little peek at him and go, Whoa! God! See, I love that. That's better than sex. And that just went, what? And he would say unkind things to me. He'd say, Baby, I may have a monkey on my back, but you got an orangutan. I, th- I thought, how dare he? Because bad luck comes in lunches, they found out in Ellen and there was a prod among them. And so they designated this poor soul that had inflicted me upon them to take me over to their husbands, who they didn't like either. <laughs> they took me through an old, dilapidated old house in Pomona and took me around the back because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Mexican. That's why they're taking me around through the back. And then they took me through the kitchen. And now I knew the real reason is because them al are standing around the kitchen doing whatever al do in the kitchen. I didn't look at people in the eye. I didn't want to see the disgust and contempt that I was going to see in their eyes. I just looked at my feet and walked through them people and once walked into a room that the very first thing that I heard was the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's music in these rooms. There's music and there's words. I never heard the words, but I loved how I felt when I was with you the very first thing, time that I came to you. You were laughing, you were hugging, you were laughing. Do you know how long it had been since I had laughed, especially not that wonderful, I am so glad to see you laugh that you had with one another. And I wanted it, and I hungered for it. I just thought, it's too bad enough that I'm not an alcoholic. (laughs) If there's another name that you and I have, it's called I Ain't Got It. I knew I was weird and I was different and three steps ahead of the men with a butterfly men net. I just didn't think I was an alcoholic. I used to be an alcoholic. When I was a kid, I used to be. But I cured it with Benzedrine. I just had not found the right combination anymore, you see. I kept searching. And so I kept, you put your arm around me and said the most important words that you and I have to say to one another. You said, keep coming back. You looked me in the eye and you said, keep coming back. Do you know what that feels like? when you're used to people saying, keep on going, weirdo? I was so disappointed when I found out you were telling that to everybody. I thought it was just me. But I laughed when I I looked around at all them sober, single, good-looking young guys, and I said, I'm going to get me one of those. (laughs) And I did. It was the sickest one there. It had to be. I got radar. But it takes what it takes, and that's what it took for me to keep coming back, you see. And I kept coming back, and I I quit drinking and doubled up on the mill towns and Benzedrine and got weirder. And guy, this guy wants to get rid of me because I want to kill him. I always want to kill him. If they didn't be, if they behaved, I wouldn't want to kill him. You see, and I would, I would get a look in my face that would go like, I think 
it's like gone berserk. And, I, and, I, and he wants to get rid of me. I'm not easy to get rid of. I don't have a backup. I'm what is today called a stalker. I was very interested in what he was doing at all times and with whom. <laughs> it was under these circumstances that I walked into a room one day, and there was this cute little boy just gotten out of white ears. He had big blue eyes, and I have an affinity for blue eyes. Today it's blue eyes and gray hair. <laughs> he says he don't have a girlfriend, he don't have a, a car, and he, and, um, and a surfboard. And I think to myself, come here, little boy, I'll take care of you. And I did. And uh, he thought a Mack truck hit him. But after that relationship was over, he decided to become a minister, and I'd like to think that somehow, in my small way, I help push him over to God. I don't like women, and I don't trust men, and that don't leave you much. And I don't know what I'm going through is called withdrawals. I thought that you just get sober and read those beautiful 12 steps, because everybody talked about them, and you live happily ever after. Wrong. First, you got to walk them streets without any skin on. In those days, they didn't have the recovery houses. And I wouldn't have gone to a recovery house. It would have been a house full of guys, maybe, but not a full house full of girls. Don't gag, gag me. I just walked them streets without any skin on. Could not predict in half an hour. Without, I was all giddy and happy. In the next half hour, I'd be wanting to kill you or me, whichever came first. And I know today that you and I do not come together by accident. I truly believe that we come together by divine appointment. By divine appointment. And yet every relationship is its beginning and its parting. Every relationship is its beginning and its parting. It's a very hard thing for somebody like me that said, do anything you want to me, just don't leave me. Just don't leave me. But you see, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, we learn that God fills in all the empty places. He is the one that brings those people in in the first place. What am I so afraid? It's, it's sometimes we have to go through our next adventure to grow. See, But I didn't know that then. I just clung to this young man. And he, when he drank, so did I. It was not my worst drunk. It just seemed to be the most hopeless one. I don't believe you have to be desperate to stay sober. It just helps. It just helps to have no other choice, to have no better ideas, to be absolutely terrified that this could not be for me. And so I came back desperate, so teachable. I'll tell you what, I was lower than a snake's belly. I was, I was so ashamed. And the miracle for me is not that I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracle for me has been that I am still here. And that last December the 22nd, I celebrated 39 years of walking on the sunlight of the sky. And, it, and the victory is not mine. My sobriety is not mine. It belongs to us, you see, because everything in my life today, since that day, has been a little part of many, many people that have come to teach. We come to teach from and learn from one another. And every little person, every person, we leave each other a little bit inside of us, and our lives change because we come together. And I love this program. I came back, like I told you, desperate. But it's amazing how quick you start thinking. When so desperate and it leaves, you start thinking, oh, I didn't like women anymore because I was sober. I don't have a sponsor because I don't want nobody telling me what to do. The group was my sponsor. I believe today that for the first five years of my sobriety, I just gathered information and thought I was working the steps. But I'll tell you what, when the shit hits the fan, that's when I knew what kind of a program I had. And what happened to me about five years sober is I, the first mistake I did 
was went out into this in the New Year's and sat out under this, the beautiful stars and moon and said, God, let this be my willing year. That was the last time I asked for anything great from God. It was the shittiest year of my sobriety. I'll tell you when my girls started taking drugs and drinking, and I would say, God, spare my babies, and he didn't spare my babies. I became suicidal again because of them bitches. <laughs> they cured me from kids. <laughs> One run away, and the other would say, I'm never going to do that to get it to you, Mom. And then she'd teach me the one running away. <laughs> Try to kill myself. That young man and left, went and left me. And I, had, I did have a woman sponsor by this time. She was sober a long time and speak to me in, in foreign language. And I go, yeah, you're right. That's what I should do. Yeah, you're right. Okay, whatever I felt like it. I didn't know I was doing that. I was so self-deluded, you see. But I'll tell you what, it brought me to my knees. I'm not going to say the F word, but it was the F word knees. I'll tell you what. I got made peace with my higher power. I said, okay, God, you never want me to be happy again. All you want me to do is work with a sick woman drunks and let them puke on me. All right. All right. <laughs> and it's from the women in Alcoholics Anonymous that came around me at that time. That, had, that taught me about being a woman. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we learned to be each other's mamas. I never had a mama. My mama died, and we never really could quite get together. It was a, like a totally different communication. But in the women of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned to have sisters, and I've learned to be a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. But it is because I threw myself into this program without any reservation, knowing I'm never going to be happy, that I walk with dignity and self-respect today. When I got to the other side, I touched a power and a strength that was way down inside of me. And I knew that nothing and nobody could uh, ever own me again when that I, big idea hit me, that nobody has it to give whatever I demanded from them. It comes from a power greater than myself, you see. And so my job since that day is to work these steps, to throw myself into this program. I never believed that the second step was real for me because I thought as a twig is bent, so grows a tree. But I know that in this, in this program, God, the power, I called it a higher power because I couldn't stand the word God. I said the higher power writes straight lines with crooked pencils and builds mansions out of rotten wood and makes chicken salad out of chicken shit. <laughs> I got another sponsor. This is, was my real sponsor. She talked to me in my language. She used to say things like, Angie, you don't have to sit in your own shit just because it's warm. Her name was Mary Reagan, and she, she saved my life. She was my sponsor for, over, for almost 23 years, and I loved her. And she was mean to me, but I knew she loved me. I knew that I, I was special to her. And, you know, and we used to work together. There's a man here that remembers when I used to work with her in the care unit. And uh, we worked for five years. And one day, there was this cute guy come in through there. And she said, well, you know, it's a no-no. And I said, I know, I know. I'm not going to do anything for you. <laughs> My children, in the meantime, had come and, and stayed with me. I didn't even want to come back to stay with me, but they came back and stayed with me, and I went to school and learned to become self-supporting through my own contributions. And when I was sober a while, I learned again what I had inside of me when my sister that had always been held up as an example for me chose to take her life, and it was my destiny to be the one to find her. I could not believe what was before my eyes. But something came together that said, God is the only giver and taker of life. She chose to go, and he let her go home. Ray O'Keefe used to say there's a level of pain that God just simply will not allow us to go through. And for some of us, it's death. And some of us, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know I have been spared because I am God's melody of life. And he sings his song through me. I am an instrument that he flows through. 
And I am so grateful to be that. And I became a grandma. And I finally learned how to get away along with kids. You just give them everything they want. It's amazing, amazing how easy that is. They do grow up, though, and get to be girls. <laughs> it was at that time that I met Richard. I was 13 years, and so I 13-stepped him. These people had, and there was nothing else for us to do but to pick up this simple kit. And because we did that, we could rocket it into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. The great fact is that God, this and nothing less, that we have deep and effective spiritual experiences that have revolutionized our life and so on and so on. And I am here tonight because he has touched me and it, and it through you and for you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.